Hello everyone, I'm Ian Waterhouse and welcome to Barking Mad, yes, the official podcast of the British Automobile Racing Club. And uh, I'm a little bit sad, actually, because it is time for the final episode of our inaugural series. Uh, It's certainly gone by in a flash, but don't worry, because we're going to make sure we sign off the year in style with a jam-packed finale coming up. Uh, Now, of course, before we get cracking, I need to introduce my Barking Mad co-host. And it's not only a different location this week, he's actually in a different continent as well. Alan Hyde, welcome. What time is it and where are you? Uh, what time is it now? This very time, as we're uh, we're doing this podcast, it's just gone ten o'clock at night. Um, oh. On uh, what are we? Monday? Is it Monday? No, it's Tuesday. <laughs> it all gets a still bit tired. Oh, it's still jet lagged. Travel all over the place. Yeah. So <laughs> I've just gone ten o'clock at night. I'm in a, 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 a completely empty, apart from me, um, a brand new press center at Macau, and uh, oh. they've built this amazing press press center um it being used for the first time this year it is probably four times greater in size than um uh, nice. than the facility that we had for many many years it's just over the way over the other side of the paddock and it is um i think as you can see it is vast it's like a a, a formula yeah. one press center it's absolutely brilliant there's only me and the security man just outside um who- he wants to go home alan they've, they've opened it just for you he wants to go home. That's his job. I've been told I can stay here as long as I like. And it will be a long time because we've got quite a podcast ahead. Not surprisingly, it's the last one of this year. Yeah, it, it's pretty sad, actually. I can't believe how quick these things go. Episode 12 already. Um, but right, I'll tell you something, though, Alan. What an episode we've got coming up for you because uh, very shortly we are going to be joined by former world champion. He's also coincidentally not too far away from you, actually. He's in Macau himself, touring car superstar Rob Huff. is uh, going to be on the show. After that, we'll be chatting to Matt Burkett and Ben Wilshire from Driven International. They're responsible for building a virtual dream track. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the BARC event manager, David Whedon. He's making one last appearance to sign off 2023 and help us select some Barking Mad Award winners. You know what I didn't do, Ian, and, and this is remiss of me. I didn't ask you what you've been doing since we last saw each other. Listen, Alan, you're in Macau. N- nobody cares what I've been doing. You're, you're in Macau. I've just been in football, but you're, you're doing the real stuff right now. So, so no, no, nobody cares about that. <laughs> Everybody cares about what you're doing. I've been doing a lot of motor racing things, you know. Um, uh, so a couple of weekends ago, we had the, on the Saturday night, we had the uh, Toka Night of Champions. So we crowned yeah. Ashley Sutton as a as a four-time champion. The following day, I went down to uh, to uh, Brands Hatch um, and enjoyed the truck finale. Um, did you and stick also, around for the fireworks? So uh, did I stick around for the fireworks? <laughs> I mean, seriously, what's happened to fireworks? since? I, so I haven't seen fireworks probably for four years during the pandemic and all that kind of stuff. Um, but they now have, have fireworks that make little shapes. And oh, there yeah. were little love hearts with arrows going through them. And uh, so, yes, I stayed for the fireworks. And yes, I stayed sitting in the car park for 40 minutes after everything finished. But it was worth every minute. But something else <laughs> that happened over the course of that weekend, um, it was the final of the legends. And, uh, yeah. and uh, so it was really nice. I was invited to go along to, to, to the finale just to watch as a spectator um, uh, from a, a driver, an amazing quick driver, a really nice guy who I've made friends with over the years. And Will Gibson uh, uh, yeah. claimed his first title um, and bless him. Look, so he was quite chuffed that I was coming along to Macau and he gave me a Will Gibson hat. So oh. I thought he'd rather like to see the Will Gibson hat in the press room at Macau. He's an avid listener to the podcast. So there you go, Will. That's for you. And well done. Can on I being just say, Alan, our, the, the BARC YouTube channel comment section has just blown up uh, with uh, positive <laughs> comments about how uh, good that looks on you right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, well it's come all the way out from england and i decided to bring it just for the podcast so um uh, will's going to be dead chuffed about that as indeed he is about being a, a champion in legends and um and as you as you say and what a show we've got what a way to sign off series one but before we get started it's time to tell you all about our fantastic partners bp fleet solutions uk who allow you to invest less on fuel and more on winning. BP Fleet Solutions keeps on delivering huge value for Barking Mad listeners. They are now offering 8p per litre off fuel at 1,200 UK petrol stations across the UK. 
Uh, yes, indeed. This exclusive offer for BRB members and Barking Mad listeners saves you 8p per litre off standard and premium grade fuels. Uh, there are also significant savings to be made on electric charging too. Uh, this really is an offer exclusive to the Barking Mad podcast. Uh, right then, Alan, I'm ready. I know you're always ready. So let's kick off the final episode of 2023 because this is the Barking Mad podcast. <laughs> It's time to welcome our first guest and for all of the places in the world for him to be, he is literally just a stone's throw away from me here in Macau. He is a former world touring car champion, uh, a race winner in the British Touring Car Championship, pretty much quick in just about anything he drives and is an all-round top guy as well. A very good evening to nice view out the window, Rob. Rob Huff, everybody. Evening, Rob. How are you? Thank you very much. What a wonderful Hello, intro. Rob. I'm going to have to employ you at some point, Alan, aren't I, yeah, for, it for, would, for something or other. I, 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 we, we, uh, I very would, kind of I you. I would do Thank it for gratis. For wonderful... <laughs> Thank you for the, the wonderful intro. Uh, yeah, here we are, uh, end of the year, grand finale in uh, in my favourite place on the planet where, uh, where where there's a racetrack concern. So, uh, yeah, wonderful to be here. and Thank you very much for having me on. Oh, it's brilliant to have you on. So, Rob, how far away are you from Alan right now? Alan, are you in the media suite at Macau right now? And, and Rob, you're quite high up, I, aren't you, in your I hotel? I'll probably show you out the window. I think Alan's over <laughs> here somewhere. So I'm, I'm in the, <laughs> the media centre, actually in the paddock. Um, and Rob is at his hotel, which is probably about a 15, 20 minute walk away from where I am. That's it, yeah. So you've got the uh, turn... Turn one, which is the flat left, then Mandarin, which is the fast right, and then sort of halfway between Mandarin and the first big braking zone is where I am. And uh, significantly, the big overtaking point on the circuit. I know you in a touring car decide to overtake when it's two lanes and walls on either side and all that. You squeeze your way through. Did you not tell me once at Macau that if you finish a, a race with both wing mirrors, you haven't been trying hard enough? Yeah. Very much, uh, man, mainly qualifying, mainly qualifying. I think, yeah, the, the, the marshals here used to come round after each practice and qualifying session with a cardboard box full of carbon fibre wing mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> the team, the team managers would basically, you know, lucky dip their coloured ones out, and uh, yeah, a bit of repair and stick them back on the car for the next session. It is the most incredible place. Now, Rob, let's let's. Um... Let's circle back to the start, shall we? Because I uh, almost a little bit starstruck, actually, because we've never met before. Uh, but throughout the time I've been watching motorsport and involved in motorsport, you've been a bit of a household name, but we've never met. And I was quite amazed to see, actually, that you've only had one full season in BTCC, which we'll circle back to that one a little bit later. But let's go back right to the start. And your love of motorsport, where did it come from? My love of motorsport very much came from from my dad. Um, you know, one of the biggest questions you get asked throughout your motorsport career by the press and, and when you go and do, you know, after dinner speeches and all the rest of it uh, is very much, you know, who's your idol, who's your, you know, what what inspired you. For me, it's, you know, it's, it's not Senna, it's not, you know, Nigel Mansa, it's my dad. My dad was my big inspiration uh to 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 get to where we've got to if you like you know i don't come from a motorsport racing family at all i come from a family of motorsport fans you know my dad from early as i can remember dad was taking me to to racetracks um will hire 24 hour at snetterton we'd go down there with the tent camp overnight half the time we put the tent the wrong way around and the rain would come in and we'd come back to a flood <laughs> flooded tent um and then BTCC, and so our dad was dad was a, is a, by trade a chartered surveyor uh, from Cambridge Suffolk area, and Will Hoy was also a chartered surveyor as well. So they, let's say, I, I guess, ended up you know bumping into each other through business, and then off the back of that, we go to some British touring car meetings, and then Dad got involved with some of his friends with Simon Harrison back in the day when Simon started with Formula Ford before he got to touring cars. So. They were sort of dad and some of his friends were, were sponsoring Simon, and it, it kind of 
just grew from there. We were going, you know, to a lot of races and I just absolutely loved it. And from the earliest age I can remember, just if, if it had wheels and a motor, I wanted to, to play with it. I want to take you back to a, a, a memory in your early career, Rob, that I remember really well. And that was the, 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 the catalyst that started it all really for you in breaking into the, into the big time, if there, if that, if that's an appropriate way of saying it. Um, but it was the Sayat Cooper challenge. Um, and it was yep. a, an amazing prize that was offered at the end of the year. Um, I'm not sure it actually worked out to be quite as amazing as it was advertised because I remember it being advertised um, as a, a drive in the BTCC. Fantastic. That was really cool. But also I remember something about and a flat in Monaco for a year. Now, there was a flat in Monaco, but it wasn't quite giving you a flat in Monaco, was it? There was someone else living in it. <laughs> Who just happened to be... <laughs> that, that- it just happened to be Jason Plato. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it was advertised very much. I mean, obviously, <laughs> Sayat Cupra, uh, you know, rocketed my career into touring cars. Absolutely. Uh, but, yeah, it was yeah softly sold, should we say, <laughs> um, as, uh, as, as a flat in, in Monaco, which very quickly <laughs> turned into use of a flat in oh, Monaco. Yeah. Which very quickly turned into, if Jason wanted you there, you were welcome. If you didn't, <laughs> go away. <laughs> Did you get to go no. often, Rob? Did he let you go and stay often? <laughs> he wanted a good when, roommate when, then. When, when, when he was quicker than me and when he beat me on a weekend, I was very welcome. When it was the other way around, no. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I can well imagine. Um, but it was, but, wasn't it? I mean, before, but, I mean, before that, though, Alan... Um, I, you know, it's, I kind of find it a bit of a shame actually because they don't exist now. Those sorts of scholarships, let's say, yes, yeah. but effectively, I won three of them. Mm. You know, the first mm. one I ever won was the Jim Russell World Scholarship. Yes, that put me in Formula Vauxhall Junior for a season. The second one I won was the Tim Sugden Clio Scholarship, which put me in Renault Clio's Cup for a year, which was the most insanely competitive year I think I can remember of any saloon car championship. Uh, and then, obviously, as you said, the, the the Cooper Championship, which put me in the BTCC, and and I guess more importantly, put me in front of Rain Elaine Malik, who uh, who very kindly chose me to go and uh, enter the world scene with uh, with Chevrolet. So it it was a loss for us, really, to only have you in the the BTCC for um, just a, a very short period of time. Um, maybe we'll get you back at some stage in the future. We'll talk about that in a little while, but um, to go on to the world touring car um, package was ultimately your, the thing that made your career, wasn't it? Yeah, a hundred percent. It was an amazing, you know, obviously we did, like I say, we came from a family that only knew motorsport from the fan side. We didn't know the ins and outs and, um, and the way motorsport worked as, as such, let's say. And, and that probably helped us as much as it hindered us. Um, I think, you know, ultimately winning the, the, the Cooper Championship, putting us into British touring cars was absolutely, you know, amazing. What a, you know, I grew up watching BTCC on, on grandstand on a, on a Sunday afternoon. So, you know, to, to then all of a sudden go from only having what four years of car racing experience to then being on the grid with the guys that I'd grown up watching on telly was quite you know mind blowing and then obviously had a very good year with my first year with Sat in BTCC I think I finished sixth or seventh in the championship uh, had a couple of wins you'll probably remember Alan my one at my home circuit at Snetterton which was absolutely mega um and then, yeah, obviously, uh, Sayat were continuing with two cars in BTCC, one for Jason and then one for the new Cooper champion the, the year after. But they were also quite keen to expand to three cars and had touched base with me on, on what my plans were, what we were planning on doing, and had expressed an interest in, in keeping me for the year. Uh, and, and, you know, amazingly, I was getting a, a phone call from Ray Malik asking me, also what my plans were for the for the following three years um, because he had a very interesting proposal about going to 
the world championship with a, a, a car company called Chevrolet. May I ask about um, what it felt like when you got that phone call? Because um, that must have been a sort of a, a pinch me moment, wasn't it? Massively, absolutely massive. It, like I say, we didn't really know the ins and outs and, and the way it sort of worked as such. So, yeah, I mean, to get a, a phone call from, from Ray Malik to ask me if I could go and have a very, very private conversation with him in his office uh, about, you know, the potential for the future. Uh, you know, it, it makes my hairs stand up on my arm now just just thinking about it. It was it was it was so surreal, absolutely so surreal. Um, and there's a very interesting story that I might tell you a bit later about <laughs> how I almost I almost lost that contract oh, wow. before I even signed it. Oh wow! Oh, we need to hear and this. Not many, not, yeah, we need there's, to hear there's this. Very very few people <laughs> who know about this story. But yeah, I mean, if you look at it on the basis that. I was with Chevrolet for eight years. In the eighth year, we got told, obviously, that it wasn't going to be continuing. About three quarters of the way through the year, we got told it wasn't going to be continuing. Um, and then, obviously, I, I, I finished full circle with, with Chevrolet and with RML with winning the World Championship right here in Macau. Um, I, I, so I, you did mention during that that um, I would potentially remember your win at your local circuit your home circuit i do um but probably for not the reasons that you might think and it's exactly the same reason why i remember so vividly you winning your uh, world title in world touring cars um because for me it's uh, motor racing is so much about people and uh and 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 families and i remember the the, the joy of your biggest supporter your dad um when when when, when you won at snetterton um and likewise, when you won your, your world title here, I, I had the honour of talking about that and I had the honour of talking about you at Snetterton as well. The, the support that you've had from your family, from your mum and your dad and your sister and um, the whole family along the way, that is what has propelled your career, I'm sure of it. Yeah, very much so. I mean, you know, we, we yeah, I've been hugely, hugely lucky. Uh, with the support that my dad's uh, given me over the years, you know we've been a, a probably like the gruesome to some tag team in a lot of paddocks all around the world. Um, <laughs> so, so Rob, let me stop uh, you, know, you there. We've... If if you're if you're like this this um, gruesome to some, tell people about the registration number on your car and his car that would be parked side by side in the paddock. <laughs> Go on, because it's brilliant. Huffing, huffing. Huffing and puffing. Huffing and puffing, parked side by side. <laughs> <laughs> it's just brilliant. Yeah, we, we do we we, we 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 have tended to come as a pair over the years, that's for sure. Um yeah, I, you know, I'm just hugely lucky with, with, with dad, obviously. Um that he you know, he, he's never pushed me, you know, he's never mm. sort of said this is what we're doing or anything like that. That we've the path is very much sort of opened along the way, should we say, and we've stepped left or we've stepped right. Um, he's very much been involved in, in every part of my career, you know, all, all the way. And it's only in the last four years, really, since COVID happened that uh, effectively, he's, he, you know, he, he's, he's not been able to come yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, very much in the last few years. And as most people will know, he's, he's suffering with a bit of Parkinson's, mm. which, which obviously hampers him a bit more as well and obviously stops him from coming to places like Macau. Um, but yeah, ultimately, you know, for the best part of probably 20 years, you know, a few years before the cars, he's been to every single race that I ever, ever did. And I, I even remember one year, you know, the MGB, Alan, that I've, I've raced uh, for many, many years. And I continued to race it even while I was with Chevrolet in the World Championship. I remember he was away on a, a, a golfing holiday or supposed to be on a golfing holiday. And I was going off with my mechanic, Stuart, in the MGB to Croft or somewhere like that. <laughs> Uh, uh, and and he couldn't handle it, and he he diverted and, and come to Croft <laughs> for the day before he then went back golfing with the boys. So, so yeah, cool. no, I've been very very lucky with that. He's been my number one supporter from from the start. He's never he's never tried to tell me how to drive a car. 
Um, you know, he's very much left me to my, my own devices, but he's been there for everything that I've needed him to be there for. And uh, I mean, he's definitely the first person to tell me whether he thought, you know, I did good or, or not on the weekend. Um, and after uh, Bathurst last weekend, he sent me a, a message saying that he thinks that I'm driving better than I've ever driven. So, oh, you know, well. that, that and, and that support is, you know, brings a tear to your eye. Yeah, I should say it really does. How emotional, Rob, was it for you then in 2012 when you sort of you'd, you'd won at Macau, you'd won the world championship, you get out the car and you see world champion next to your name? What, what were the emotions going through you there? Uh, it, it was absolutely amazing, but it was quite short lived, unfortunately, mainly because of the fact that I knew I was out of a job. And that program yeah. was was yeah. over. So, you know, I kind of look back and I go, do you know what? I never actually got to enjoy no. the period that I potentially should have done or could have done being, you know, of being a world champion. So it was literally, you know, obviously we had a, a mildly aggressive party on the Sunday night in Macau. Um, you invited me. And I remember it well. <laughs> it was quite a good one, wasn't it? It was quite a good one. Um yeah, I mean, you know, so that was obviously brilliant. I took all that in, enjoyed that very much. And it, you know, it was everything that I ever dreamt it would be feeling wise of, you know, searching for the sort of golden, golden star, if you like, that is being the best at what you do. Um, the problem with motorsport is you get about two months before you're straight back in again. And it, it's a it's a vicious circle <laughs> because you know you want to be able to enjoy it, but you're straight back in, and immediately the the the, the pressure is on. Or in that case, effectively we were out. Um, you know, myself, Alan Menu, Ivan Muller, we were all out of a job, and um, um, and the full focus was was back to trying to find a contract for the next year. Now you've mentioned a few teammates there, Rob. Uh, let, let's ask you this question. Who was the fastest teammate you've ever gone up against? The fastest teammate? Um, that's a very good question. You're going to upset loads of friends now, Rob. Think very carefully about the answer. Yeah. I'm trying to think who my teammate in go-karting was, Alan, in like 95 <laughs> or something. <laughs> good idea. That's a great idea. Yeah. So, so you know, it, do you know what? It is, I've, I don't think I've ever looked at any teammates going you know, wow, you are supersonically fast. It's it's more, again, where the racing is concerned, who is the toughest and the hardest to deal with. Yeah. Um, and I think that will probably goes to Jason, if I'm honest. Jason was my first ever proper teammate. Um, and he was very clever. He's a very, very clever man. Um Jason and I are great friends. You know, we, we, we've stayed, stayed very much in contact. We get on very well. But as your first ever team, and I, I think that Jason's one of the reasons, I think, why I've managed to do so well. I have to thank Jason a lot for, for this. I always do in all the articles that I do in, in magazines and so on. He was so hard on me that I had to learn very, very fast. And that the way Jason was with me completely prepared me for... Alan Menu, Nicola Rini, Ivan Muller. Um, Jason was tough, very, very tough. Liked to play games. Best mate one minute, didn't talk to you the next minute. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, but, but ultimately, that is what prepared me for going up. You know, Jason was the best of the best in, in the UK. Uh, and that totally prepared me for going up against the best of the best in the world. That's a really good answer and a, a, a really good way of putting it as well. The toughest teammate over the years. But what what has it been like driving mm, with like these that. these other legends of touring cars? You are clearly one of them now. But at, at the time that you were entering the world championship, you weren't legend status at that stage. You weren't a world champion, but you were coming up against drivers that you've been watching on telly, on Grandstand, on BBC One for many, many years. Did they make it helpful, easy for you? It was very annoying and very frustrating. <laughs> you know, you're, you're going to, you know, learn all these new tracks. Obviously, I sort of grew up in, in the UK. I had a, a very quick rise to BTCC. So literally three or four years learning the UK circuits. And then all of a sudden you get thrown into the European yes, yeah. and the world circuits. And yeah. they are completely different to what we have in the UK. Yes. I mean, literally, we've got 
you know, Silverstone, which is obviously, you know, the biggest, the most open uh, F1 track we have. Uh, Brands Hatch, I guess, is quite a close second. But the European tracks are completely different to the UK tracks. And, you know, it takes time to learn all the bumps, or, or, you know, all the jumps, all the tricks, where you can cut, where you can't cut, what works in, in which car. Um, and so you have to learn that all over again. And then you're up against, you know, two world famous teammates with BTCC titles and, and Formula One experience, Formula One experience with Ferrari, for instance, with yeah, Nicola. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then you look left on the grid and you've got what Andy Prio, James Thompson, uh, Farfus. Uh, you look right on the grid, you've got Zanardi, the Mullers of Dirk Muller, York Muller. Um, uh, Duncan Hoisman, you know all of these guys. Tom Coronel, uh, everywhere you looked was was a superstar. Um, and yeah, the boys weren't easy. They weren't no, easy no, on us no, at all. No. You know, they they taught us lessons very quickly. And I think you know that's an, an, another thing that Jason was was great with me for because that you know that year with Jason, or well, two years with Jason, because he was our mentor in the Cooper Championship. Um. And yeah, those years prepared me very, very well. And I think, you know, 2005 was our first year in the World Championship. We had not the best car on the grid, for sure. But 2006, we came back with a stronger car um, and, and all three of us started winning. You mentioned Andy Prio at one stage, who was known as being the expert, the master in a touring car here at Macau. Um and was responsible, really, after having great weekends for the final meeting of the year in World Touring Cars for his World Championships, picking up a huge amount of points. Um, you are now the master of Macau in a touring car, and you've won more races in a touring car around this place than anyone anyone else. It is a unique circuit. It's a, an incredibly hard circuit. It, it doesn't take prisoners. If you have an accident here, it's going to be a big accident. There's absolutely no doubt of it. What is the secret of you? Um, and I mean, you must be going into this weekend feeling pretty good um, because you are um, equal um, top points, aren't you? In the uh, world yep. CR tour. Um, and the final meeting is yes, says Rob Huff. It's at Macau. Um, what, 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 what is your secret? What, what, why are you so good here? I'd love to be able to tell you. <laughs> Again, it's it's a question I get asked a lot. Um, I'll, I'll never forget uh, when I met my girlfriend Bella, um, her brother. Uh, <laughs> we were, we were, it was the first time I, I met her family, uh, and it was a mum and a brother and a little sister. Uh, we were in a pub in in Suffolk, um, and her brother Victor, bless him, had sort of not said anything the whole time over the lunch that we'd we'd had um and just as we, we were leaving the restaurant he turned to me and he went so what is your secret to macau <laughs> <laughs> and it was just the most random question from this lovely lad that i'd never met before um and and i was completely uh, I, I don't have the answer i really don't i don't know it just it's, it's a secret, Rob. That's why, isn't it? It's, it's a secret. It's, it's going to be a secret that, that goes to my grave with me, I think. Um, it's just that it's, I just find it the most amazing place. I've always loved circuits that you have to build up to. Um, and I hate circuits, new circuits these days, which have all the runoff in the world. Yep. You yep. go out on the first lap. Yep. You can completely outbreak yourself on, yep. on every corner on the first lap. And immediately you know where the no-go zone is yeah. and immediately you've got a very good idea of where the braking zone is. Um, you can't do that here. This is old school. This is a circuit that, like Anna says, if you get it slightly wrong, it bites you and it doesn't just bite you, it bites you hard. Normally, if you crash here in the practice sessions, you're not racing. You know, the car is destroyed and that's the end of it. Um but it's one of those circuits you have to really approach in the old school manner. Mm. And and again, I think growing up in the UK and the UK circuits helped me with that. You know, as Alan said, you know, Prio was always very, very quick here. And I think it's a trend of the UK circuits. You know, you cannot just go to Thruxton or Alton Park or Knock Hill and go flat out on the outlap if you don't know the track. It's a they're all circuits you have to build up to. Um 
Macau is one of those circuits that you have to build up to. And it, it took, you know, it takes a few years. It's not, doesn't tend to be a place that you would just come to and win on your first attempt. Um, there's little, uh, in the Armco, obviously the Armco has little bends in it, like, uh, like has the, the tunnels, the sleeves in, yes, in yes, the Armco. Yeah. And ultimately, as we spoke about earlier with the wing mirrors, you know when you're going fast, when you get the pictures are from the photographers afterwards, and on every corner, your wing mirror is inside the sleeve. Wow. Wow. I, 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 did, uh, I did a quarter track walk today, Rob, and, and I have to say, so I went down from uh, Mandarin down towards... At Lisboa, I spent quite a long time at Lisboa because it it it, um, it always surprises me just how tight the corner is. Yet it's a great overtaking opportunity. But um, and I so uh, ten years I've been coming here now, and I just marvel. I, I marvel not only at driving a car fast, but racing alongside and how close the barriers are. I mean, serious respect, absolutely serious. Yeah, Man- Mandarin Corner, Alan is. Is scary as you like. Yes. I'm not going to lie. Like yeah, Mandarin yeah. is in it. In F F three F four, it's flat and easy yes. flat. Um, I didn't know this, but uh, the GTs have been easily flat through there for about the last six or seven years now as well. Wow, it's almost flat for us in yeah. sixth. We en- we we arrive there at sort of two fifty. Blooming. And have a breathe on the throttle to about two thirty seven, two thirty eight is what you're aiming for to go through there in quality. Wow! And the whole car is sliding. The whole car is sliding, wow. and effectively, you know you've done it right. <laughs> let's say because there's no armco there; it's concrete wall. So you know you've done it right when the car slides up to the painted line on the left, the white painted line. Yes. Yeah. And when the tire butts up to it, it grips and you, you don't hit the wall. And that's when you know you've done it well. I, I have to ask you the question. Nerves of steel. I, well, <laughs> I was going to say... It's ner- nerves of steel or stupidity. Steel. I'm not sure. I've not worked it out yet. <laughs> Maybe a bit of both. <laughs> it, it hurts my head to think about this, but um, you ju- Ian, you just said nerves of steel. Do, do you get nervous before um, any circuits? And, and in particular, do you get nervous before Macau? Yeah, I think Macau's one of those circuits. You just have to, you have to have so much respect for the circuit. Mm. You know, uh, I think uh, again, my, myself and uh, my teammate Fred Vervish, we were talking about it earlier. Um, it, it's just, it's such a crazy circuit. It's so easy to make a mistake, and it's you don't really have to do anything wrong. Let's say in normal terms to to get it very wrong here. Yes. Um, it's just one of those circuits that I said to Fred earlier, I, you know, for me, it's obviously we're in the, you know, gambling mecca of Asia. Uh, and I, I do feel the track is, is a bit, as I'm going to sound probably insane now, I, I feel the track's like a little bit alive and it kind of chooses. I feel the track has chosen me so many times over the years. You know, there's so many times that we we've won it and we've deserved to win it. There's been times when, We've not been leading, and we've won it because others have fallen by the wayside. I remember when I won it in the in the red larder when Tiago was ahead of me. His power steering failed with two laps to go. I had Ivan in the the F one Citroen behind me, um, and and somehow managed to hold him off. But I remember the last lap, I hit the wall three times, and the car didn't break. Now, normally with that larder, you wow. looked at it and it broke. Then I hid in the walls. Then I hid in the walls around Macau. So I do feel that this track, um, yeah, has, has, has chosen me over the years and he's very, very kind to me. Wow. Absolutely fantastic. What sort of prep work goes in then, Rob, for Macau? Let's, let's sort of look into it. You're heading into the weekend now. Uh, you're at your hotel, but what, what's on your in the on the agenda tomorrow and then the day after and then and then getting into the weekend? B- bottle of whiskey, calm the nerves a bit. <laughs> I know the hotel are looking after you, aren't they? Uh, the, we were out for lunch earlier today, and, and, and Bella even said to me, she said, "You're not worried about this weekend, are you? You're not nervous about it." And obviously, she would know better than anyone. And and I'm not because I just think with this track, it's. 
it, what what's meant to be is meant to be. What will what will be will be. You know, case or are and um, you know, there's so many factors that are out of your hands um, that you just you just got to roll with the punches here. You've just got to go in there, do your bit. I'm I'm very confident in my ability in the car that I'm driving this year in my Audi around here. I've uh, you know pictured it and imagined it many many times. We've got zero weight coming here this weekend. Uh, so I'm very confident in my ability, that, but then you end up with the, uh, let's say, the responsibility of everyone going. Well, surely this is all. This is yours. You know. You know. This is. This has got your name written all over yeah, it. Added pressure, isn't it? Uh, and I tend not to focus. It almost annoys me that people go, "Well, you've got this in the bag. Surely it's Macau. You know, you're, you've won here eleven times. You, you know, you've got the lap record in every touring car around it." Yeah, but it, it still, you know, does scare the hell out of me, this place. Uh, ultimately, you know, uh, Alan's obviously seen over the last two years, especially when I've, I've come and done the Chinese stuff. I'm racing a car, I'm driving a car for the first time in Macau that I've never driven throughout the whole season with the MGs that I've raced the last two years. And I think last year we were on pole position with a 233 or something like that. And then in race two... I did a 2.31. Now, obviously, normally qualifying, you would go much quicker than the race. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's just frightening to come here in a car that you've never driven before and, and do it that way around. It's frightening. And the problem is you then get suckered in that reverse grid. Jason was leading. I was trying to chase him down. And you get suckered into then driving much faster. And I've learned with Macau, you kind of only need to do what you need to do when you need to do it. Um, yeah. You don't need to be a, a hero every time. So, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm very confident around here. I obviously love this place. It's been great to me. I've got a hell of a car for this weekend. But I will still only do, hopefully, what I need to do when I need to do it. Yeah. I did mention earlier on, uh, Rob, that um, maybe at some point in the future we could welcome you back to the to the BTCC. Um, you had a round, you got in a car, like you were just saying, that you'd never driven before. I don't think you'd ever seen the car before when you turned <laughs> up at Knock Hill and drove three races uh, in the BTCC um, and then witnessed a rain shower, probably like you've never witnessed before when you were <laughs> sat on the grid waiting to go for, for race three. Um, and you've publicly stated that you, you'd you like to come back at some stage. Is is that looking uh, we're towards the end of this year? Is, is it looking like it might be sooner rather than later? Yeah, I, obviously, you know, uh, it's no secret I've moved back to the UK now. Um, I would, uh, you know, love to come back to the BTCC. It's, it's where I started. Um, and I do feel I've got unfinished business there. I've done the World Championship for 20 years now. And, uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, always looking for options and, and, and what potential there is. And, of course, yeah, I had the opportunity to, to jump into a BTCC car at Knock Hill. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Loved being back in the paddock. Uh, was quite surprised at the welcome I got from everyone in the paddock. It was a, a really nice experience. Well, you're a nice bloke. Um, it was nice to see you, for goodness sake. Very kind of you. Um but yeah, so it was just, you know, it's it's something I would definitely be very, very interested in. And yeah, am I speaking to three or four teams on the grid about <laughs> opportunities for next year? Cool. I certainly am. How cool is that? That's very cool indeed. Uh, I mean, being back in the BTCC paddock, it, undoubtedly you bumped into plenty of familiar faces from all those years ago because we're all still doing it um, uh, remarkably. Uh, the likes of Alan Gow, I know you worked a bit with with Will Fuchs. Um, um, those relationships, Rob, um, how important are they? Because they, they kind of formulate early on in your racing career and and continue right the way through, don't they? Yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, you know, Alan Gow, obviously, I met him when I started in British Touring Cars. And then he's been on the, the World Touring Car Committee for the whole duration, I think, that I've been in racing out here as well. So, uh, yeah, obviously, you just stay in touch with these people. And, and I think he was uh, really pleased to see me at a, a very wet knock hill um, <laughs> in the freezing cold, as opposed to, you know, with you know, swimming, swimming shorts on in a nice country. Um <laughs> But, you know, yes, yeah, so obviously, you know, and, and, and he's, 
he's been uh, let's say very helpful in uh, putting me in contact with uh, with quite a few people and a lot of journalists in the UK have been very helpful as well uh, with uh, let's say pointing me in the right direction uh, and then obviously Will I mean I've known Will for what 15 years now and uh, it's no secret that, that he's doing very well you know, in his uh, within his business, with his uh, company, doing what they do, and Will and I have got a great relationship, and we feel that we've got something together that we could potentially bring to to UK motorsport. So, yeah, we are currently in the process of of, of trying to put that together. That would be very good news indeed, Rob. Yeah, I certainly hope to see we'll that. Um, see. Rob, thank you so much, so, so much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to be watching on telly. Alan, of course, you're going to be trackside, I imagine. So it's the best of luck this weekend, Rob. And hopefully we'll see you back in the UK in the BTCC sooner rather than later. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Right, everybody, it's time to switch gears because I am delighted, and I really mean this, to welcome two people who have been busily working behind the scenes. And when I say busily, oh boy, oh boy, I really mean they've been working very busy behind the scenes. And to build our dream track, you may remember asking a number of our guests to uh, choose a corner from any circuit in the, in the world. And we have got Matt Burkett and Ben Wilshire from Driven International, the brains behind the project. The guys have been doing all the work. Uh, Matt, Ben, welcome to the Barking Mad podcast. How are we? Very well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's yeah, great to join you all. And uh, uh, yeah, we've listened to the podcast and the other guests talking about their dream track. We've been working on it. So it's yeah, good to be able to talk a bit more about it with you. Well, we've been quite lucky to get you then, haven't we? Because when I said you've been working hard, you really have been working hard. But for those people who aren't particularly familiar with Driven International, give us an overview of what it is you guys do. Yeah, so, um, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us. As Matt said, we've been working hard enjoying this. Um, we're, uh, we're a design company. Um, I, I say to people, we're an architect and engineering company, but with a real niche um, in that we work a lot in motor racing. So, we get involved in designing all sorts of uh, cool and exciting venues, including racetracks. So anything from, you know, literally from karting tracks, um, we're working on some four by four tracks at the moment, um, driver experience centers all the way up to F1 tracks and, and obviously dream tracks as well now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, we, we're quite lucky to do what we do. Um, we really enjoy it. We've got a good team here of, you know, uh, architects, civil engineers, and then visualizers as well that put everything together in one. So, yeah, we're excited to excited to share some of our experiences with you and, and have a chat. How do you get involved in this type of thing? Because you know, when you're a kid, I remember designing tracks when I was a kid on just a bit of paper. But then to actually go to it for a living—I mean—is that not the coolest job in the world? It, it's definitely uh, it's definitely one at dinner parties that catches people's attention. I'm sure. <laughs> you know, you sort of go around the table and, the, you know, what do you do for a job? And you always think, oh, do I want to open up a conversation? Because you know as soon as you say it that people are going to ask more. But, um, yeah, that's really cool. So, I mean, as a kid, um, so I, I, I started the business um, back in 2015. But as, as, a, as, a, as a youngster, uh, my dad was involved in motorsport. So I spent most of my time, you know, in the paddock areas, walking around, looking at race cars and, and always wondering maybe one day if I could could drive and things. And then it was only really as I became a bit older, I studied uh, motorsport engineering and technology. So I studied at Brooklands and then at Hertfordshire University. And my trajectory was I wanted to go into race car engineering. You know, I wanted to be an F1 and, and be a race engineer. And that's really where I was, where I was heading. Um, I was really lucky uh, to meet a chap called Clive Bowen, um, who runs another company, track, track firm called Apex. And I, I worked with him for a number of years and, and learned a lot and did some really cool projects with them. And then I spent two or three years working at uh, the Transport Research Laboratory before founding um, Driven. And um, it's been a really, really fun experience. Um, so I kind of, yeah, so I, I really sort of fell into it kind of by accident. The fact I had some engineering skills, the fact I'd done a you know, bit involved in motorsport, I could do CAD drawings. Um, it just putting all that together really and, and landed on my feet with some luck as well. And it just worked hard to keep 
to keep in this industry and keep going at it. Um, and as I say, started, started in 2015 and grew from there. Um, I did some work with, in the early, early days when we started the company, did a lot of work with Motorsport UK on sustainability and looking at the environmental impact of race circuits and, and with the FIA as well. And that's kind of, um, was our first projects. And then obviously, um, it just, it just grew from there with more inquiries. Um, it's probably worth adding in that alongside all my studying, I started doing kart racing as well. So when I was, but I started quite late, I was 17 when I started karting, which was very late compared to most people. I'd had enough of, um, crashing into trees on my mountain bike by that point. So I decided <laughs> to go on to, decided to start karting. So, um, yeah, I raced in, uh, all the junior karting. So, well, like the, the, uh, short circuit karting, and then I did, um, long circuit as well for a number of years. So that was my kind of in parallel, my hobby as well. So yeah, engineering, karting, racing, hard work, university and luck, really, I think put all of those together and that's how we've ended up doing what we do. So here on the Barking Mad podcast, we asked a number of guests and clearly you're uh, both motorsport fanatics, motorsport interest. Um, so you knew many of our guests, if not all of the guests that we've had this year, and they came up with some pretty cool ideas um, about their favourite corner to add to our BARC virtual track. So how did the process start? Did you literally start series one, episode one, you've got one corner on a CAD drawing and then the next one gets added and the next one gets added. And then you think, no, hang on, that one's going to go better there, isn't it? So how, yeah, what yeah. was the process and what did you each individually do in this process? Yeah, it's definitely been a different process to what we would normally follow for any standard project where normally we have a very definitive site boundary and elevation changes, stuff like that. So being able to have a blank canvas and just time to play around with layouts and shapes and sizes was really nice for this project. Um, but yeah, we sort of waited until a few guests had given their um, contributions before we started putting the track together um, just so we could create a nice loop um but it's been a real challenge actually like it may seem yeah, quite an yeah. easy thing to just take these different corners and stitch them together but you've got to think about you know the approach speeds into each one trying to replicate that to be as true to life as possible um a lot of them were downhill corners as well we found so eventually you've got to get back to where you started so trying to put the 3d together to create a full lap has been quite challenging um i, I would say that's probably one of the most important points because a lot yeah. of people talk about what's your favorite corner um or what's your favorite track and, and the favorite corner thing is always an interesting one because it's it's never usually one corner it's the whole sequence so like i always use maggots and beckett's at silverstone as a good example a lot of the f1 drivers always really talk about that and eau rouge as well at spa and what makes that corner is the entry is the entry speed. If, if you were going into those corners coming out of a hairpin, it'd be completely different. So, yeah. um, as Matt said, like probably the biggest challenge was getting that sense of scale, um, in terms of the entry and exit speeds to allow the corners to flow and then just how that eats up space quite quickly. Um, yeah. in terms of the roles that we both had, like Matt and his team, they really did the, the grunt work of pulling all of the corners together into, into the first draft. And then I sat with you and went through like, okay, let's move this corner to here. I think maybe we can swap some of them out. As you were saying, Alan, like maybe it would be better to, you know, change yes, the yeah. order of them. And then we were also looking at things like um, the runoff areas as well. That was a big consideration. So, um, you know, there's a lot of circuits that are much, much older now. If they were built, you know, in 2023, the chances are you'd have more runoff areas or there'd be different regulations that the FIA have now set that would mean the corner might look quite different. So we wanted to create something that had good flow, good sequences, like we just explained to get the speeds right, but all then also to make the runoffs realistic. So for example, if we've got elements from a street circuit, we don't want to have huge asphalt runoff areas because it's not going to feel the no, same. True. So yeah, we true. were trying to get, you know, how do you go from having something where you've got huge huge amount of runoff area, all of a sudden into funneling into a street track, for example. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you achieve that? So that's where I pitched in to just sort of do design reviews, which is, which is 
pretty typical of how we how we run mm. things here day to day anyway on other on other projects. Yeah. You mentioned maggots and Beckett's there. Was there any other corners that you really struggled to uh, find a place for and, and really had to move around a few times? Because it's a bit like a jigsaw, isn't it? Only you've almost got to hammer the pieces in rather than slotting them in nicely. You're right, definitely. Yeah, I think, yeah, Maggots and Beckett's, like Ben said, quite an open track, Silverstone, lots of runoff area. And we were thinking about, you know, what comes after that. And we have these street circuit bits we need to put in. And then we were looking at, you know, the 2D Maggots and Beckett's. It sort of gradually slows down as you go through each curve. And then we thought, well, Bathurst, the Dipper, is kind of similar with the approach there. So we thought that seems like a natural fit to go from maggots beckett's into that one but bathurst has obviously got the barriers right next to you so yeah we kind of just gently brought the barriers in as you go around it and you know when everyone eventually sees the virtual model that we're creating alongside this like i think we've done it in quite a natural way the way it doesn't just come upon you out of nowhere so that that's been a challenge i think the other one as well has been um sort of the end part of the lap where we've got the uh, the Fox chicane from Poe into Knock Hill, we decided um, like two chicanes that are quite, you know, you blip over each curve really in quick succession. So putting those together felt quite natural. Um, but there was no one bit that was easy because if you change one bit, suddenly you've got to rotate the other bits the, yeah, for yeah, it. Yeah. Bit. One, uh, one debate we did have in the office, honestly, was where the pit lane goes. So yes. we, we, we actually played around with flipping the pit lane on the other side of the straight a few times. And that's always something that comes up with track design because obviously you want drivers to be able to exit um, easily and you know safely, but then you also want them to rejoin ideally well off the racing line um, and also not really in, in a big braking zone. So, and that, that's a real headache for us, honestly, on a day-to-day -day basis when we're designing tracks is where you put your pit entry and exit and then obviously the paddock area that, that you need a big space behind so i think we've um we've done that quite well here where we've got the ability to 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 come off the track and rejoin off the racing line but it could have worked either side really we could have got it to work so yeah. that was a bit of a consideration as well that we that we did play around with so now the track's complete isn't it the, the track's done we've seen it We're, we've shown it on the podcast i'm sure we can uh, pop it on screen for you uh, as well, if you're watching on the BARC YouTube channel. Uh, am I right in saying people are going to be able to drive it as well? Virtually, of course. <laughs> Virtually, yes, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, our team of visualisation technicians have been progressing the virtual model of this over the last few weeks. And, um, yeah, we've driven a couple of basic uh, versions on our simulator here, and uh, it, it does feel great. <laughs> and hopefully, you know... We'll be able to share that and everyone can see it as well um but yeah i i like honestly i was a bit worried about how it might come out on the simulator because you think like, okay you put all your your dream corners down sequences and there was always this moment of like okay now let's watch what it looks like to drive and, oh it's not quite what i imagined but it honestly it is it is it's incredible so if this track ever got built I think we can safely say it would be a lot of people's dream track. A we'd lot of would we'd say. need a fairly large expanse of, of ground, wouldn't we, if we were to yeah. build this? Um, how long is the circuit? Can you tell us how long it is? Yeah, it's 6.5 kilometres long, so it's a well, big... It, well, so, uh, so here at Macau, 6.1 kilometres, so don't worry, we can do this. Yeah. yeah. It's not... Yeah, that's <laughs> the thing as well. We didn't want to create something that was completely unrealistic, so 6.5 you know it's it's a long track but as you say it's not it's not unrealistic um no no yeah so, i think yeah just important definitely and well whilst we were designing it you know we didn't want to put in these you know really unrealistic sequences together like we did want to make it feel like it, it could be a possibility if you were driving it and okay it may seem a bit strange going from an open airfield at thruxton to the harbour at monaco in the same track <laughs> but <laughs> if you found the right spot you could do it maybe we need to do a uh do start doing a land search and see if we can find somewhere to build it uh, yeah that would be cool how cool you, would you've that got be? a degree of license so haven't you when it's virtual sorry alan go ahead <laughs> are, are you both drivers do you, do you both drive in in real world as well 
Yeah, so I've been racing. Um, so I, when I was younger, I raced in carts and then on and to super carts in the British Championships. Um, I'm still racing today now. So I actually really enjoy racing at club level with the 750 Motor Club. Um, I've been racing with um, Team D DTO Motorsport in the 116 Trophy. So it's um, it gives some relevance. They're not the fastest cars in the world for sure, but um, they there is close competitive racing. You get to go to all the tracks as well around the UK that the touring car package would go on, for example. I've driven so. one of those cars around Brands Hatch. It's um, they're, they're good fun. They're really good fun. Yeah. Super close racing. You have to really drive them smoothly. You know, you probably have to work for your lap time maybe harder than you would in a more powerful car because you've got you know you, you really need to carry the momentum. And, and Matt and I are going to be doing some racing next year together. So he's just yeah. uh, just got his license as well. So he's oh cool, very quick. Yeah, <laughs> I'm more from like the simulator driving background, really. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, I feel like I've driven every game and combination of car and track <laughs> possible, and just generally been a bit of a racetrack nerd growing up. Uh, always on Google Earth and looking at service roads and runoff areas. So that's kind of how I <laughs> became interested in track design. And then since joining Driven, yeah, I've had the opportunity to get out on track a lot more, which has been fantastic. So it's probably worth saying. So when, as the company was growing, you asked how, you know, I got into doing this. And I suppose we didn't cover your side, which was that um, we actually did some work um, quite a few years ago down Rawton on the airfield there working for um, television show which you can probably guess there was you know three famous presenters that did uh <laughs> did, did laps around their track and so we helped them to, to build the track there and one day I was online and I actually found that someone uh, had spent some time converting the track um, for the television show into um, like what they would do if it was an F1 track and it was Matt. <laughs> so, oh, wow. so Matt, I, I, I hunt, we hunted him down and said, like, you need to come and see us. And uh, what he'd done was really, really cool. So he he was hobby hobby track designer before he joined us and had done oh, a, a yeah, really cool. And head hunted. Wow. Yeah, I was How in my cool university that? bedroom just doing it for fun after I watched the first episode. And I thought, yeah, let's post that, see what happens. And then I get a message from Ben and it was like, oh. This Dream is quite job. cool, <laughs> and he lives, you know, lived within an hour of our office. So it, was, it could have been anyone anywhere in the world, but it was, yeah. Um, yeah. There we go. So the stars all aligned that day. Exactly, oh, they cool. did. Absolutely, absolutely brilliant. So, as drivers, if each of you could pick a favourite corner from a circuit and put it into our circuit, you're not going to do this. We're not going to ask you to start messing up your circuit. But um, is the is your favourite corner in there already? On that. I think it, one of my favourite sequences of corners is from a track that is in the dream track, but not necessarily my favourite. But I think, you know, growing up, I am a huge F1 fan. F1 is what I love most for watching racing on TV. And I do think that the whole opening sequence of Silverstone, as it is now, it just works so brilliantly. I mean, if yeah. you watch the first right. lap of... 2021 British Grand Prix obviously there was a big crash at Cops at the end of it with Hamilton and Verstappen but you know they were crossing side by side for about eight corners and that whole sequence just seems to work so well so I mean I can't really take a third of an entire circuit and put it in the dream track but, <laughs> that's um, when it's a good circuit that's <laughs> cheating but um yeah, I always think that's Let it have such. A... Oh, and also actually, uh, the Senna S, I think I'd put in again. Huh. Just watching F one, you can overtake around the outside, the inside. Yes, just yeah, it just works so well. So I think that would be my contribution. Okay. Um, yeah, tough question. So I would say I'm just going to go based on my own racing. So it'll be UK. Um, I'm sure there's lots of corners around the world where if I thought harder, I could probably pick a few. Um, you know, it's the obvious kind of like. You know, in Suzuki, you've got the SCs and, and Nordschleife, you've got different corners and O Rouge and things. But I, I, but I will go for, um, based on, I, I love driving at Alton Park. For me, it's one of the best tracks in the UK. It's up and down. It's, um, yeah, that Parkland setting. So Cascade to Alton, which is, I think, oh, turn nice. two or turn three, depending which what, what you call a corner. As you dip down and then it sort of bank and carries you around. I really like that corner, um, just from it, the flow and the way it feels. But in terms of 
sort of bravery I would then pick. Sorry, I'm I'm choosing three. I know you said one, but um, I would say. Well, you're pop, designing pop. the tracks, and yeah. so we've got a brand new one now between you two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Between Matt and I, we've got another track here. Yeah. Um, I would say Cops Corner at Silverstone, and I think Richie's Turn One at at Setton as well. They're both super fast right handers, yes. so it's always yeah. that yeah. one where. Like for me on every track, you should have this. There should be one corner where you have to hold your breath every, every, you know, when you turn and you go, can I do it flat out this lap? And uh, some drivers can and some can't. And I think that's, that's a real test for drivers on a circuit. So that's why I would choose those two as well. Quite similar. Good answers. Mm. Good answers. Right, guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, on the Barking Map because I actually think uh, I'm going to be coming down to see you at the end of this month. Alan, you might be coming along as well. So uh, we're going to drive that track. Uh, it's going to be so cool. I'm so looking forward to this. It's going to be absolutely yeah. amazing. Uh, Matt, Ben from Driven International, thank you for joining us on the Barking Mad podcast. It really has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Look forward to seeing you uh, on the simulator. Yes, I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> It's now time to introduce our final guest, and it feels only right that it's someone that's been on this podcast pretty much as much as uh, Ian and myself. It's BARC event manager, David Whedon. Hi, David. How are you? Good, thanks, chaps. How are you? Really good. It's good to see you, David. Good to see you. See you. I actually saw you in the flesh um, just a couple of weeks ago at Brands Hatch for the for the trucks and fireworks and legends and pickup trucks and everything else in between finale yeah. at Brands Hatch. Uh, what a day. I was only there on the Sunday, but what a day. It was busy, wasn't it? Good Lord. Uh, just mad spectator-wise, just absolute sellout. Um, Racing-wise, some great racing. We had some incidences. Obviously, the event stopped a little bit early. We didn't get those last two races in on Sunday. Um, but but apart from that, cracking finish to the year, especially for stuff like junior saloons with their champion uh, being decided, the truck champion being decided. Um, so all in all, a, a great way to finish the season. Did you stick around for the fireworks, David, as well? I, I did, only because I was waiting for four did. radios to come from the med centre. So I had to watch the fireworks <laughs> until, the, <laughs> until my radios <laughs> had come back from med centre. So... Um, I watched the fireworks by proxy, but um, no, yeah, I did. Uh, always a, a fantastic um, show that that brand has put on for the fireworks. Um, a couple of years back, we had a driver who um, his daughter wanted to go, and um, the, the public tickets had sold out, so he actually went and bought a race car to Are put a serious? race entry. Yeah, seriously, wow. ex BTCC driver, um, basically bought a coupe cup, paid the. Hit wow. three grand for the cheapest race car he could get. Did the wow. two races just to get the four drivers' tickets so he could get his daughter oh, in for the fireworks. That? What an advert for the event, eh? Goodness yeah, me! No, mad, it was a it? it was a feel good event. I was walking around. I, I, you wouldn't have got time to go over to the Colin Chapman Way and all the um, all the show trucks and the, all the stalls, and you could barely walk. You could barely walk around. It was so so busy. It amazes me how much effort people mm, put into the, the show and shine trucks absolutely the, the, the show trucks are just phenomenal yeah yeah um the amount of effort they go into them is just unbelievable um i, I won't lie to you i've ended up following a few of them on um youtube i'm not watching yeah so so it, it's mad but there's um there's so many um guys who who almost professional show truckers and yeah, yeah, go yeah. to all these shows professionally um, and have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of followers on, on YouTube and, and Twitter and TikTok and everything else. So, yeah, and I found myself following a few of them. It's 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 interesting to see. It's good to see what goes on at a race meeting when, because we're stuck in race control for most of the event. We yes. don't really get yeah. to see what's going out in the, in the public area. So it was, it was Donington mainly because it's such a big one, Donington, the, the truck meeting there. Um, so, yeah, so guilty following <laughs> following show truckers on youtube uh, nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with that made it public. right we've got important business to get on with oh, you oh, i'm looking forward to this yeah yeah <laughs> this is the moment i think alan everybody has been waiting for isn't it now of course you may remember in the last episode 
Uh, we were asking for help with categories, of course, for our Barking Mad Awards. Uh, we've got a number of them. Uh, we, we've all selected. Uh, we've got Driver of the Year, Car of the Year, Race of the Year, Moment of the Year, Guest Story of the Year, Podcast Outtake or Moment of the Year, uh, and Unsung Hero of the Year as well. We've all selected our own particular moment, Alan, David, and myself. So let's start, shall we, with Driver of the year now we've all selected one that I, I, I there's not one specific winner but it's who we have selected david let's come to you first who is your barking mad driver of the year um i, I put a lot of thought into this and i looked at a lot of different categories um and the one driver who really impressed me this year is a guy called sam wilson races oh, in sam. Yep. classic touring cars in the aston martin ricky cans aston martin he races in, in a class sometimes by himself. And because of that, he doesn't get to score full points sometimes. Um, he, he'll get half points there because there's not enough people in his class because he races such an obscure vehicle. Um, but he, he outdrives some faster, more modern, more capable uh, you know, vehicles. He, he really races hard. Um, he comes second this year overall. To get second overall in the classic Thunder when you're not collecting full points at each round, <sighs> superb. So, so for me, Sam Sam Wilson in in classic Thunder. Alan, um, my driver of the year is a, a fairly obvious one, having followed around the Quick Fit British Touring Car Championship all I year. I think I know who it is. Ashley Sutton is something to behold. We are lucky to be around to watch Ash Sutton race. He won the BTCC title for the fourth time this year. If he does it again next year or the year after, he has won the title more than anyone else since the championship started with Jack Sears' win all those years ago. And we are lucky to be around to watch Ashley Sutton. Not only that, but his little son who is not yet one year old. He was born this year, little Sonny Sutton. He was all dressed up at the Toka dinner just a couple of weeks ago in his own uh, proper dinner suit with a bow tie, the lot. Uh, it, just the whole approach, everything about him. He is my driver of the year, Ash Sutton. Brilliant stuff. What now, about uh, you, Ian? Well, like, like both of you, actually, I put a lot of thought into this and I had a number of drivers I thought about. You mentioned the, the Thunder in the classic touring cars. David, of course, Nick Vaughan was the uh, the winner of that one. He was up there for me. James Dunkley was up there in the, the Blue Oval Saloons. Of course, Gary Preble, uh, always a regular winner in, in the 03s. Def Flock, of course, in the Junior Saloon Car Championship. But actually, my driver to you, a little bit different, comes from the Coupe Cup. I mean, I know you mentioned it a little bit earlier, but Luca Statini Anzanello, he's, uh, he's a, such a nice chat. Always got a smile on his face. He's quite a fiery character picked up the title this year it meant so much to him going up against of course you know the rockets as well and um yeah it, luca sashini antonello such a nice guy such an asset to club motorsport he is my driver of the year my next one uh, sorry the next category is car of the year uh, alan let's come to you first what have you gone for it's fresh on my mind because I watched it only a couple of days ago at the first meeting here at Macau. It was, I think, the race debut for the Lotus Emira. It is the most gorgeous looking car. Um, oh. There were two Lotus Emira entered um, in our GT4 race at the weekend. And one was for a British driver, Adam Christodoulou, making his debut here at, um, uh, at Macau. Um the Amira looks absolutely gorgeous. They locked out the front row of the grid. Uh, they, they came one and two in the race, and it is just beautiful. It was in um, a, a sort of a black and gold, that, which for me was evocative of, of Lotus racing in Formula One with the JPS livery. Um, and also, it was the nearest miss in motor racing I have ever seen. If you haven't watched it back, uh, watch it back on YouTube. It is lap one of the GT4 race at Macau from last weekend. Um, and it was an accident that came within a centimetre of happening that the, the, the leading driver who was in an Amira would have had no idea that that accident nearly happened because it was behind him. And at the end of the race, one of the teams showed him the video on a phone and 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 his face as he watched it back and then grabbed the phone to rerun it and watch it again it, it right so just brilliant i'm um, i'm in love with the car i think it's gorgeous brilliant david um 
mine's not a car. It's a truck. Oh, <laughs> is it? Is it? Oh, you can have a truck. <laughs> yeah, you can have um, a truck. Ryan Smith's Daimler Freightliner. Yeah. Oh, I knew you were going to yeah. say that. <laughs> I, I just... It's just... I mean, don't get me wrong, he is a top, top, top driver. But um, what a beautiful machine. Yeah. yeah. For a race truck. For a, yeah. You don't expect them to be... They're, they're usually flat-fronted and a bit boxy. And this isn't... It's got a nose and mm. it's colourful. Mm. It's got a really good colour scheme on it. Um, and it's fast and it wins. Um, so it ticks all the boxes for me. So yeah, Ryan Smith's Daimler Top, for yeah. liner. Well, Alan, I've gone down the touring car route, actually. So Have I you? Know well it's put a smile. Oh, yeah, it'll put well a smile done. on your face. I've gone down the classic touring car route, though, uh, for this one. No, no surprise there. Now, as you know, we've had a couple of super touring events this oh. year. Uh, Richard Wheeler owns a couple of, I believe it's the 99 Nissan Primeras. Uh, and so obviously... It's got to be that car, isn't it? The Nissan Primera owned by car. Richard Wheeler. Stunning history, everything involved in it. And at those Super Tour events, they just steal the show. Everybody wants to see them. What yeah. a treat yeah, it yeah. has been to see those cars back out on track. Not just the Premieres, but all of them. Uh, but what a real treat it's been in 2023. And to, and to give it its full title, that Anthony Reid would have said in period, uh, the Vodafone Racing Nissan Primera GT. He never Perfect. called it the Nissan. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, right, gentlemen, let's move on to our third Barking Mad Award category. Uh, and it's Race of the Year. David, let's come to you on this one. What have you gone for? Um, it's, it's a Caterham race from July at Thruxton. I don't know if anyone, anyone's seen it, but it was the I think I was the first there. Caterham. Yeah, I think I was there. It was, it was the free 10 race on the Sunday morning. Um, it was won by Thomas O'Flanagan. Um, but uh, the top two took each other out right at the last corner at the chicane on the last lap, the two leaders. Um, Dominic Mansberger came from 31st to 3rd, and the top 15 were covered by 2.5 seconds over the line, 15 cars in, in two and a half seconds. Wow. It was just phenomenal. Wow. Um, Slipstreaming, 4-5 or breast into the chicane at Thruxton. Um, Caterham and Thruxton, they, they go well together. All catering races are good, though, aren't they? All of them. Yeah, of course they are. But when you get slipstreaming, they're great for slipstreaming. So when you've got a circuit like Fruxton, which is fast, flowing, wide, big braking zone, it just lends to, to catering racing. Alan, what have you gone for? Uh, no one's going to like me. I'm probably not going to be invited back next year. Um, it's got nothing to do with BARC. It's got nothing to do with cars. It's got nothing to do with trucks. It was the final race of the season for the Bennett's British Superbike Championship. Uh, Fair it, it, it goes back a, a, a few years. We've had some great finales in the BTCC um, when, as each lap goes by, uh, the, the lead of the championship changes. Um and this was the same kind of thing. The top three in the championship were battling it out, changing positions in the top three on the track. It was absolutely breathtaking. I wrapped my legs in circles all around myself. I was so nervous. I was shouting. Um, uh, it was, I, I, I'm sorry, it's two wheels. It's nothing to do with BARC, but it was my race of the year. And I have to be honest to myself. There's nothing wrong with that, Alan. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, absolutely. <laughs> the, 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 good choice, by the way. Very good choice. Yeah, um, right, mine. Choice. My one, this one. And this this is more actually for a, a, an emotional uh, moment as well as the race. And it was British F4. And it was Deegan Fairclough's first win. He picked up a win mm. up at Knock Hill. Now, I've known Deegan for a few years. Uh, I've known but I've known his mum and dad for a while. And especially his mum. I've embarrassed a number of times on the live stream. And she hates being on camera. She can't watch... Deegan race whenever there's a race when she goes off and she she does washing up in the hospitality or anything like that she runs away she hides she's absolutely petrified so I know what it meant when Deegan Fairclough picked up his first ever win in British oh. F4 it came at Knock Hill in August and um, j just the emotion of it. it it's one of those moments isn't it where you, you know when you're just so happy for somebody because I've known him for a long time on a personal level and and to, to see him get over the line and I'm delighted to say he's going to be back next year as well in F4 with high tech I believe so uh yeah remember the name Deegan Fairclough his first win at Knock Hill was my race of the year uh right let's move on to moment of the year shall we uh, Alan what was your moment of the year 
uh, really easy for me to work out. And again, you're not going to like me because it's a bit quirky, a bit like myself, really. Um, it was a moment at a round of the Quick Fit British Touring Car Championship. It was when uh, Napa Racing, um, once again, won a Manufacturer's Award or possibly the Team Award. I can't remember which, uh, but at Croft Circuit. Um, and what you have to do before the podium, you have to work out which member of the team is going to go and pick up the award. Napa Racing UK decided that they were going to let a super fan pick up the award. Brilliant. Um, he comes to every round in a wheelchair. His name is Brandon. His dad brings him. Uh, Brandon doesn't um, uh, doesn't talk to us uh, too well. Um, so he kind of communicates a, a little bit through his dad. Um, he's a massive Napa. So he's fully togged up from toe, top to tail uh, with Napa Racing stuff. Um, and Napa Racing said, Brandon, would you like to go and collect the award? And um, and he didn't go in his wheelchair. His dad carried him onto the podium. Oh. Uh, the response from the crowd was unbelievable. Um, the joy on Brandon's face was unbelievable. That by a million miles is my moment of the year. Oh, oh, I almost don't want to give mine now because I just feel a bit selfish. Uh, David, what was your moment of the year? <laughs> um, it, it happened actually at the last meeting at Brands Hatch Trucks. Um, Sam Waters, who's our um, well, one of our safety car observers, um, asked us on the Saturday afternoon if it was possible for him to propose to his girlfriend on the grid oh. <laughs> um, during the truck race the next day. So we did some... Um, hurried organizing on on the saturday evening with the the live stream guys and 24 7 and um organized it for it to be live streamed um so it's great so we we um told her there was a grid walk when there wasn't and we we got her onto the grid just as he oh, pulled wow. up in the pace truck jumped out the pace wow. truck and then and then proposed to her in front of the the grid of wow. 20 british racing truck championship trucks on the grid what did so she say she said yes that's a result do you know, what? I've had the same this year. I, I had exactly the same. I had to present a uh, uh, engagement uh, or a proposal anyway, and uh, it did go well. It wasn't with BARC, so uh, we'll just uh, move on very quickly. Um, yeah, I kind of feel bad for saying this actually now because it's it's more about me, <laughs> to be honest. My, oh. my moment of the year, um, w- without being arrogant or big-headed, for me, my moment of the year was was going to Goodwood, actually, Festival of Speed. Been before as, as a spectator, and, and what an event. And of course, I know BARC heavily involved providing the marshals, etc., and the organisation of it. Um, and it was being part of the team this year and getting to sit down with the likes of Mark Weber and Sebastian Vettel and David Coulthard. And, and it was just, it was a wow moment. It was a pinch me moment for me. So, um, That's yeah, so I wish I'd gone first now because I think That's a good <laughs> I wish answer. I said my moment first because it's all about me. <laughs> uh, you, you guys, your, yours are better. Your, your, yours win. Yours definitely win. <laughs> Uh, right, let's let's move on to our next one, shall we? The Barking Mad Awards. Uh, guest story of the year. Uh, David, what was your guest story of the year? Um, so it was um, when we had John Cleland on the podcast. Um, one of my all-time touring car heroes. Um, talking about my favourite ever touring car race, which was done it in 98. Yeah. And yeah. it was when he was, he was telling us about how he... Um, Kissed wing mirrors with Mr. Mansell, uh, giving him a, a welcome to the BTCC, and then Nigel storming into the Vauxhall garage afterwards um, with some expletives. Um, so that that was my my guest story. John tells a good story, doesn't he? John tells a great story. He does yeah, that. Absolutely superb. Good answer. Alan, what's, what's yours? Um, well, mine is really recent. It was in the last episode uh, of the Barking Mad podcast. It came from David Addison, who tells a good story. Uh, we twisted his arm and got him to do a, an impression of the um, the legendary yeah. commentator Neville Hay. And it was about when he set fire to the commentary box, all the papers in the bottom of the commentary box at Thruxton, um, and um, in no uncertain terms, switched off the mic and asked his son Richard to start putting it out in the most natural way possible. Addison tells that story so well, so beautifully. And the impression of Neville is spot on. Yeah, go back and watch that, by the way, uh, at the BARC YouTube channel, because it is brilliant. It really, really is. Um, I've enjoyed all of them, of course. Uh, I've really enjoyed the Formula One stories we've heard from the likes of Tiff Nadeau and and Rob Smedley as well. Um, But if we go back to episode five, when we had Joe Tanner on, and um, it was just something that stuck in my mind. Uh, And it was when he was telling us 
about his helmet design course. And I don't know why it's just stuck with me. It just had me in stitches because the helmet design course. <laughs> and there's a Brilliant. course for it. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's exactly that. <laughs> yeah. But there've been so many. There have been so, I mean, it was actually really hard to pick, wasn't it? Because um, it was, I yeah. mean, you could pick, yeah. you could, we, we could have almost done one per episode, couldn't we, really? But, uh, but it wasn't really hard to pick our moments of the year, Ian, and you picked one about yourself and David and I didn't. So there you go. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's like I won't be back for next year. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it. None of us are going to be back. I, I picked BSB, for goodness sake. Yeah. Uh, well, look, we're having a bit of a giggle, uh, so let's keep that theme going, shall we? And let's talk about the podcast outtake or slash moment of the year but it's got to be podcast related. Uh, Alan, yeah. let's come to you first. What have you gone for? Yeah, no, I don't have one. Uh, there were no outtakes. I did everything absolutely perfectly as the year went on, and I never used any words that weren't broadcastable. Yeah, we're going to have an extended outtake episode coming out soon. <laughs> 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 what did we go for, Alan? What, what, what was uh, your moment? Yeah. Uh, um, um, so it, it's a particular personal favourite of mine um, that when we are, uh, so so we are joined before we, we go live and do a live thing, um, we all we all meet up together. So producers and everybody, and we have somebody on our production team uh, from the BARC called Ella. And, and Ella makes me giggle because the last vision I have of Ella before we go live is a big, pot of pot noodle and then Every she time. puts her and she puts her camera off and i've got this image of a pot noodle and i have to get my face <laughs> in the right bit. so it, it's a uh, thank you ella you've made me giggle lots this this year david what's uh what's your uh outtake or moment of the year podcast related yeah it was um a moment i had um li i listened to all the podcasts usually on the road and it was um on a on a jaunt home down the the A303, got onto the A34, I was listening to the Tiff Liddell podcast. And I was just sat there, sort of 75 on the road, thinking, I can't believe I'm sat listening to Ian Waterhouse and Tiff Liddell discuss the difference between a Crocman shirt and a croque madame. It's what a time to be alive. <laughs> yeah, well, that's something for people to put in the comments. What's better, a croque monsieur or croque madame? It's, the correct answer is that he's a croque madame. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair uh, enough. Brilliant stuff, <laughs> David. Um, mine, uh, of course, we had Ian Flux on, didn't we? So it was probably the use of the amount of times we had to use a bleep machine. But actually, I'm sorry to do this to you, Alan, but it was the time I first saw you in that leather jacket. Uh, I have to say, I was blown away and found my new man crush, to be honest with you. Uh, no, <laughs> no. It always way. comes to Macau. It always comes to Macau. In fact, I That's think it, it was at me. Brands Hatch a couple of week back, weekends ago, was it not? It was at Brands. Was it at Brands Hatch? I don't think it was. Yeah. At Brands Hatch, was it? Was it? <laughs> <laughs> if it was. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Uh, thank you for doing that. You've, you've made this episode for me. Um, right. Our final category uh, for the Barking Mad Awards it goes to the Unsung Hero of the Year. David, uh, what have you gone for? Um, I have a couple, actually. I have, I have two sets. Um, the first one is um, Sonia Gibbons and, and Holly Kerr from Classic Touring Cars. Yep. Uh, just... They run about like headless chickens from a from a point of view of bark it's our biggest championship for the number of drivers we have there's a lot of admin pre-event during the event post-event and and sonia and holly are always there they're so organized they run about unconditionally for everybody um so so from, from there one of my unsung heroes of the year and um, the other one is, is a guy called paul rice he races in track attack um, and he also helps us out in the paddock with the junior saloon drivers. So when he's not prepping his own car or getting his own stuff ready for track attack, he's, he's helping us out with JSCC. Um, and and you just paddocks are full of cars, full of people, this and the other. And he tirelessly um, looks after the kids, makes sure they get to uh, out their awnings correctly, get to the to the um, park firm safely. Um, and he's just such a cheery gentleman. It's really good to have around. Um, so they're my two, oh, sorry, three, but yeah, so Sonia and, and Holly from CTCRC and, and Paul from, from Track Attack and JSCC. Brilliant. Yeah, I echo those, actually. I know, I know both um, both of them very, very well. Uh, Alan, who have you gone for? Um, it's a 
pretty obvious one, really. Um, and um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure we all sort of back it up as well. Um, our marshals, our volunteers for yeah. race weekends, because we say it um, as a matter of course at the end of every race meeting, thanking the marshals as they walk back cold, wet and in need of a, a cup of tea or something to eat before they get off on their journey home because most of them will be going to work at, at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, and it's no joke when we say we couldn't do it without you because we couldn't. And uh, the way that our volunteers at race meetings, and it's not just the, the marshals, it's the officials that work, it's some of the medical staff that work over the course of the weekend. They do it because they're motor racing fans. And at the end of the day, that's why I do what I do. Uh, that's why you do what you do. Yeah. Um, and and, and uh, they are the most incredible body of people. They have this am amazing camaraderie amongst themselves. They have great weekends doing what they enjoy doing. But without doing what they're doing, we couldn't run the sport. So uh, it's it, 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 it's an obvious one, but it's 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 all I have. No, it's, it's a very good one, actually, Alan. And and. I've gone for Marshalls too, but I've gone very for a specific event actually as well. And it was at, at Thruxton. It was the trucks, of course, and, and one of the trucks went off the circuit. And um, an awful lot of work went in from the Marshalls very quick. And we actually got racing again. Um, it was a wonderful effort. And, and I isolate that incident because I was there. I mean, every single weekend, the Marshalls put themselves sometimes in danger, don't they? And what a, what a great job they do. Um, I must say a big thank you to the Barking Mad team as well behind the scenes. Bit of unsung heroes. We get all the limelight, don't we, uh, uh, David Allen? You know, because the people see our faces, but you don't realise that actually right now behind us, there's sat quite a few people who put all this together. Once we, once we go off screen, great. We get to go in and enjoy, enjoy the rest of the day, but they've got to carry on putting all the hard work together to get it out for, for your, your enjoyment. I must just mention, as well, if I can, nine-year-old Holly Harris Brownsell. Uh, she's been raising money and awareness for motor neurone disease uh, for the My Name Five Dotty Foundation by cycling two laps, right, two laps of each circuit that the British Truck Racing Championship has visited this year. Uh, how cool is that? Really um, cool. That is absolutely awesome. So, Holly, big thumbs up from all of us here at the Barking Mad Podcast. Um, that's our awards done. How cool is that? Uh, some wonderful stuff. Put your comments in as well if you're watching this at the BARC YouTube channel. Uh, tell us who you think deserves uh, driver of the year, car of the year, race of the year, moment of the year, uh, guest story of the year. Tell us which one you've particularly enjoyed. Uh, and, of course, your unsung hero as well. Um, David, before we go, though, of course, um, winter. We're coming into winter now. What does the off-season look like for the BARC? What, what can we look forward to over the coming weeks and months? Um, obviously, we've got the... Um the um, Big Night Out Awards dinner, which is happening in early February. Um, invites will be, be going out this week to, to all our champions who have been invited. Um, and apart from that, um, just getting ready for 2024, um, organising next year's dates, getting permits to the events, getting drivers registered for championships, etc. cetera. So um, just a big push on the, the admin side, really, as usual. So, But we don't stop during the winter. We, we're already planning for next year four or five months ago so it, it's 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 never really we never really stop we're always looking um looking forward to the, the next thing all right well alan and i will see you at that party i think won't we alan <laughs> oh we certainly will yeah my invitation has already arrived very happy about it good good in fact we'll <laughs> all be there i think everybody that organizes the podcast it will we'll all be there um, oh really create generally yes. come down and do the do the interviews and and stuff oh, like cool. that. So, so Mark and Chris will be there. And so in theory, Very we cool. should all be there. Ella and Paul. Very cool. Yeah. We can have a, we can have a, a barking mud night out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just come into a room. We'll just, we'll just bomb the awards off and just, just go back to our room and have our own little party. <laughs> Uh, right. Great stuff, guys. Uh, David, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for the season as well. It's been great having you uh, on numerous episodes this no year. And we'll see you in February. David Whedon, everybody. Thanks, guys. Well, Alan, uh, that's sadly the end of the episode and indeed the end of this series. But, oh, my word, what 
a season we have had. Sad news. I mean, when we started this, uh, we had no idea how it would work, if it would work. Um, yep. You and I had never met before. Um, so, well, we we sort of crossed over each other in a pit lane while we were each doing our individual jobs. But um, before, uh, when we were thrown together, as fate would throw two people together, um, <laughs> we decided to meet up. And we met up at the most bizarre place, uh, which was the Costa Coffee in Winchester. And did we have a bizarre meeting or what? Just so that we could uh, learn a bit about each other and get to know each other. The first bloke, right, who decided to sit down with us and join us for a cup of coffee, he had what? What he just got divorced uh, or he just got separated from his wife. He was um, he was what he was having an episode. He was mortified. Um, do you remember? I, 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 was, I was just about to say, put into a bit of context, everybody. Yes, we were sat outside. Well, it was a beautiful, beautiful day, wasn't it? And we uh, were sat outside. I'm not too far from Winchester. It's about halfway for both of us, isn't it? So, yeah. so we went there. We were just chatting, chatting away, talking about the podcast. And then randomly, this gentleman just decides to come and sit, sit with us. Completely. He wasn't invited. He just sits no, with us. And we know yeah. all about him now. We know everything. and uh, yes, Everything the, about the him. And, and then there was a woman who came and sat down with us. And, and, and she, even she prevented us from talking about the Barking Mad podcast. <laughs> um, because She was interrupting as well, wasn't she? So I, I suppose we talked about the, the podcast and the prospects of doing it for about two minutes. So we, we went into episode one, not really knowing how it would happen. And it has grown as the year has gone on. Um, and it's been great. I, I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed it. And what a bunch of guests we've had, eh? It's, it's been remarkable, isn't it? I mean, even, even today, you know, Rob Huff on the show, the, the boys from Driven International. And when it, when actually I was going through the awards and th- that we've already done, of course, looking at those and going back through the previous episodes, the names that we've interviewed, oh my word, yeah, yeah. What, yeah. What, what a year. And, and it's just been, I'm so looking forward to next year is, is what I will say. Uh, so I'm yeah, very, very right. much looking forward to that. So thank quite you to right everybody to. as well for tuning in, uh, listening online of course heading over to the barc youtube channel as well and how nice it's been to be stopped at right i know this has happened to you as well alan hasn't it been walking around paddocks and around the, the public areas at circuits and people stopping you saying they're really enjoying the podcast it really does mean a lot doesn't it it's lovely yeah it's absolutely lovely we didn't know if anyone was going to listen or watch anyway and, and 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 people have so yeah quite right thank you for that a lot of memories indeed. Uh, but for the final time this year, let me tell you all about our fantastic partners that have been with us every step of the way during Series 1. It is, of course, BP Fleet Solutions UK, uh, allowing you to invest less on fuel and more on winning. The BP Plus Fuel and Charge Card can be used at 3,400 locations. And don't forget, the card can be used by anyone. So if you're filling up the team trucks, heading to a circuit as a spectator, or aiming for victory on track, there's a saving to make on standard and ultimate grade fuels. And if you haven't signed up for the BP Fleet Solutions card yet, then head to bp.com slash BARC, where you can find all this and all the information on this exclusive offer. If you need to, if you need any help at all, all you need to do is hit the callback button on the website and a BP Fleet Solution UK team member will be in contact. Yeah, now while we uh, go off into winter hibernation, don't forget to stay up to date with all the latest news and reports from the BARC via the club website, www.barc.net. Uh, and of course, it's many social media channels. If you are watching on YouTube as well, don't forget to hit that little subscribe button so you don't miss any of the action. That's right, Ian. And if you want to go back to any episodes uh, from this series this year, then you can uh, just go, you can just do it because uh, the Barking Mad podcast is available to listen to on all good podcasting platforms as well as YouTube. Yeah, that's it, Alan. That's it. Series one of the Barking Mad podcast in the books. Surely not. Close it. (laughs) It's it's done. You can go enjoy Macau. Uh, Go go have a drink for me, won't you? Uh, But on behalf of both of us, I would just like to say a big thank you to the team uh, that put the work in behind the scenes to bring it all together. Big thank you to you guys. So we we really do appreciate you getting involved in this as well. Uh, Of course, all of our guests are brilliant partners, BP Fleet Solutions UK. And of course, all of you watching and listening as well. We will be back next year for more motorsport chat. But until then, stay safe, everybody. Goodbye. Have a lovely Christmas. Cheerio. Bye-bye.